Thank you, Ken. Lorcan Dempsey oversees the research division and participates in planning at OCLC. He is a librarian who has worked for library and educational organizations in Ireland, the UK, and the US. Lorcan has policy, research, and service development experience, mostly in the area of networked information and digital libraries. He writes and speaks extensively. You can be followed on the web on his blog and on Twitter. If you aren't already following his blog, Google is your friend. Uh, before moving to OCLC, Lorcan worked for JISC in the UK, overseeing national information programs and services, and before that was director of UCON, a national UK research and policy unit at the University of Bath, which is a lot of acronyms in your resume. Um, before all of that, Lorcan worked in public libraries in what I'm sure OCLC people think of as the other Dublin. Uh, so here to talk to us about thinking about technology differently, Lorcan Dempsey. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, there's really very little difference between Dublin, Ohio and Dublin, Ireland. Um, <laughs> I, I feel right at home. Um, okay. The sound is good for people at the back? Okay. And I did ask earlier as well whether people could see me. Uh, we've turned down the lights. Everybody can see me as well. Good. Okay. The, uh, at dinner last night, the, um, uh, somebody was, was reminding me, the, uh, a couple of days ago, I put on Facebook a little note saying that I um, had recently got a, uh, an evaluation summary from an event I did a while ago. And, uh, you know, silly me, I, I actually read it. Um, but the, the um, um, you know, they're always sobering. Uh, reading them. So I, I, just, I just put a note on Facebook saying, oh, I wish I hadn't read this. Reminds me of years ago when I got an evaluation back. They made a mistake in this conference and they sent the raw, unedited valuation, evaluation comments from all the speakers to all the speakers, uh, which, which, was, which was very unfair. But what, what, one of the unedited comments about me, which I hope they would have... Um, uh, deleted if they'd edited it was, uh, Dempsey, uh, Dempsey is much better in print than he is in person. Uh, so uh, 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 somebody was saying about this uh, last night at dinner, and I should mention it. So emboldened by that, I even went as far as to put in a subtle uh, 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 note here about a recent uh, print event. Um, um, so uh, Ken uh, spoke earlier. and. Uh, was very pleased to work with Ken, or well, Ken did all the work. Um, so we, uh, ALA Publishing uh, put out a book of uh, the blog, which uh, Ken uh, edited, turning a, a mountain of text into a book. So uh, that recently appeared. It's a recent uh, print event that um, uh, you might be interested in. And uh, given the comment last night and the fact that Ken will be standing up this morning, I thought I would um, subtly introduce it there. Um, okay. Speaking of uh, print and writing, I thought I'd also remind you of um, uh, this. Uh, some people maybe have seen it, others, uh, others not. Um, but this is, uh, ACRL has just released uh, this site for comment, uh, new roles for the road ahead, essays commissioned uh, for ACRL 75th um, anniversary um, by uh, Stephen Bell, Lorcan Dempsey, and Barbara Pfister, um, three uh, totally aligned uh, voices. So you can um, um, uh, comment on that at the web. It just went up this week uh, on a comment press site, available for comment, and ACRL will will publish it um, uh, shortly. OK. So I always like to give uh, an overview of uh, what I'm uh, actually going to say. Uh, as you can see, um, there's not going to be much here that uh, you're not familiar with. Um, 
and it, it won't really it won't really be news to anybody. And you know what I talk about, you're you're all I think very very much aware of. And certainly looking through the agenda, uh, I think that's clear. Uh, well, what I hope I do is put a little bit of um, a little bit of um, shape uh, on it. Um, but it is uh, yeah uh, uh, what I uh, specialize in a um, uh, content free uh, presentation. Okay. Um, so what, what I'm going to do is say a few things about technology in a, in a library context, technology in a, a research and learning context. I, I thought I'd start, though, with a, with a, a, a little um, uh, snippet, which doesn't really go with the, the rest of the uh, presentation, but it ties in with uh, the, the uh, linked data discussion that, that preceded this event, and also uh, with some of the things that are being discussed here. And, my colleague uh, Richard Wallace will be talking about later, and the you know discussion about uh, linked data. I, I have throughout the presentation various cartoons by Gaping Void, who some of you will know, who's a commentator on our current uh, world, and, and very nice. You can sign up for a daily cartoon from from Gaping Void. So if we think about our uh, information universe, we've got a lot of text, we've got a lot of strings, we've got a lot of records. Increasingly, what we're trying to do is to turn that into a form that uh, is more usable by machines, that yields uh, more insight, yields more knowledge. And, and the way we're doing that is um, we're, we're trying to cluster data uh, into a singular identity for various entities, for people, for works, for other things. Now we want to gather data associated with those entities and, and attach them to it and, and release it. And we're now familiar with this type of thing from cards on Google or various other things. And I think Andrew mentioned cards um, yesterday. And then create lots of relationships between these. So we want to move to a, a sort of a web environment. And if you think about linked data, it's very much about um, having uh, identifiers, having hooks, having uh, data about things that we can uh, use in, in, in this different way that we can surface uh, 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 more uh, usable, if you like, uh, knowledge than, than information. And uh, within an OCLC context, OCLC research, for which I'm responsible, does a lot of processing uh, of data that, that shows up in the context of um, uh, our linked data activity, our clustering activity, our WorldCat activity, and as I say, Andrew mentioned some of this yesterday, and, and uh, Richard Wallace will be talking about it later. I, I, I'm not going to really talk about it. What I wanted to do, though, was just to give a little sense of um, scale, because I think one of the things that has changed in our uh, technology environment is this sense of scale. So in the middle there, you have, um, um, or on the, on the left, you have WorldCat, uh, we take WorldCat and we enhance it in various ways by adding identifiers, by adding links, by clustering it into works, and then we give that back, and that supports the linked data view of uh, WorldCat. It supports some of the works activity. We also push it out into various experimental services uh, on the bottom. What I wanted to draw attention to, though, was the, the, the links. I mean, quite often we talk about linked data uh, that has no links in it, but the... Um, 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 we add sort of 202 million Library Congress subject headings. This is a snapshot from, uh, I think, October last year. VF, which is a harmonization of authority files, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, 378 million links to names. Uh, FAST, which is a uh, faceted, decomposed Library Congress subject headings, 481 million. So we have individual links to identifiers which you can then gather information around, and then a variety of um, vocabularies. So as I say, the reason for putting that up is to give a, a sense of, of some scale, um, you know, that we're operating very much at a, at a sense of scale. Um, but the main thing I wanted to say was how we're actually doing some of that. And remember, this is within OCLC research, some of the pre-processing that we do that shows up elsewhere. So VF is an amalgamation of data from national libraries around the world, over 20. We take authority files, uh, we take uh, bib data and we harmonize those files. We try and say that this person is the same as this person, and we can't just do it on string matching. We have to use bib data and a variety of other clues. So we process about 152 million uh, records um, to get the, the sort of processed uh, VF. And out of that, we get about 8.3 million clusters, 8.3 million unique names, and we roll up all the data we have to, to those names. 
What I wanted to say, though, was, you know, years ago, this would have taken forever. Um, if, we, if we did it on a, in a sort of a ordinary processing environment that we have, it would take about two months to um, using the, the techniques we have to convert that 152 million records into those 8 million cl clusters. In the sort of Hadoop, uh, H-based type environment that we have, you know, the sort of big data processing environment that we do use, it takes 24 hours to process that data and move it into uh, those 8 million clusters. Um, so in that process, we, we take 152 million records, do all the matching required to generate the 8.2 million clusters, and there's a lot of intelligent stuff in terms of, you know, um, you know confidence thresholds, variety of stuff. We create 4.7 links between those uh, identities. But then once we have that, um, to give a, a JSON view of that um, takes about 45 minutes, again, in this environment. So the, the, reason, the reason for doing that, I was just, as I say, looking at the program, and I saw some of these things. And um, in the time, for example, I've been at OCLC, this is amazing that you can move from a situation where you had all of this data that really took a long time to process or you couldn't do things to a situation now where you can actually do things at scale in a relatively manageable way. So I think as, you know, Stalin um, said, um, uh, you know, qu uh, qu quantity has a, a quality all of its own. And, you know, we're making a qualitative difference here just through the, the quantitative uh, approach to just having that much more processing power. So I, I thought I would, um, as I say, start with, uh, with that. Okay. So what, what I am going to talk about um, is uh, going to think about um, uh, the way in which we think about technology, uh, less the way in which we manage technology, but the way in which we think about technology in a, a library context. And I'm going to start just by using a few examples. Then I'm going to say something about technology itself. And then I'm going to talk about four sort of challenge areas. And these are areas that you're all uh, working with, you're doing things on. And as I say, I, I don't think I'm going to say anything startling or anything new. Um, but I think it's interesting that as we think about how we move into um, uh, uh, this sort of changed environment, um, a lot of what we're doing is sort of pre-strategic because we haven't, it hasn't quite swum into view. Um, we haven't got a new organizational setting where certain things uh, have clear uh, ownership. And there's quite a lot of reshaping of uh, organizations uh, going on. So I want to say a little bit about those, those four uh, areas. I won't say a lot about them now, but just thinking about emphases, thinking moving from consumption of materials to creation of materials, uh, thinking about the importance of workflow, user workflows, um, thinking about uh, moving from a, an outside-in to a, an inside-out perspective, what that means. And then finally, say a little bit about discovery and the importance of discoverability increasingly, you know, making your stuff discoverable, not merely providing a discovery experience. So um, well, we'll see uh, how, we, how, we, how we get on with, um, with that. Okay. So I thought I'd, I'd begin just by saying something very quickly about uh, phones. And this is because we, we have a, a daughter who's a student in New York, and she smashed her phone recently. And, and I, I swear, I mean, the, 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 um, a bigger disaster one could not imagine. Um, <laughs> now, clearly, from her point of view, it was quite serious. But after a while, from our point of view, it was quite serious as well, because you know she's wandering around the place. We didn't know where she was. And the, the phone gives you that tether. The, 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 um, uh, you know, that, that actually um, is, is quite important. And, and sort of thinking about the um, uh, uh, phone, I uh, was thinking about the ways in which the cell phone has actually changed our, our experience. So now that uh, cell phones are pretty, you know, ubiquitous among certain populations, it means that we do all sorts of things differently. We can do ad hoc rendezvous. So, for example, you don't need to make arrangements. You, you, can, you can say, let's meet somewhere because you're, you're, you're connected. Um, and this is sort of like a, a micro-coordination. You don't have to decide everything in advance because you can actually, you can ring from the grocery store. You can ring when you've got somewhere. You can ring when you are text, quite right, more, more likely, when you want to be picked up. You can, um, uh, because you're constantly in contact, you can actually arrange your lives in, in sorts of uh, different ways. 
And much of that is very um, situational. We're, we're used now to being able to find things in our immediate location, to map from where we are. Um, we're used to being able to um, buy things or get things or order things quickly. We want to get to relevance very quickly. We don't want to spend a lot of time uh, moving around. And we're used to this uh, idea of having relationships with people who are a text away, who are a, a um, um, Snapchat away, who, who are in our in our uh, circle, in, in our vicinity. And clearly then, uh, you know, the importance of pictures uh, has grown quite a lot. And it's not just sharing pictures, it's sort of sharing that experience or um, saying something, coming back to the situational thing. But the, the way in which we actually manage our lives has changed um, quite a bit and continues to change. And um, uh, those changes in behavior are driving changes in, in what people do uh, with new um, cell phones. So there's this sort of uh, loop, you know, the, the network, the phone, technology changes our social behavior and our social behavior changes, the network changes, technology changes, um, the, the way in which we want to use those cell phones. Um, so really, it's embedded deeply in our experience now. And, and the experience of um, having, as I say, 19-year-old in New York without a cell phone um, for several days really, really, really brought that, um, really brought that home. Okay, so to think about a couple of uh, more directly library examples, um, citation management, are things a bit washed out? <laughs> there, are, there are a couple of very subtle index cards. Um, so, you know, at one stage, people uh, wrote down uh, citations, wrote down their uh, bibliographic data, kept filing cards, uh, kept drawers, kept notebooks, um, that moved into a word or a, a, a word processing environment. People kept files with, with them. Then what we saw was um, um, programs uh, which emerged to manage citations, to manage uh, references, to manage uh, collections of these, and they added uh, a lot of value. Um, then what we saw were uh, programs that sort of appeared to help do this on the web, and they automated some stuff. They might extract metadata from things, they uh, manage PDFs. Um, so we have a sort of progression here of um, uh, functionality that's getting progressively richer, that's including progressively uh, more um, functionality. And if you think about something like Mendeley and the way in which Mendeley has developed, what you've seen in a really relatively short time is uh, a move from this sort of solitary manual function of collecting uh, bibliographic data on index cards it's evolved into this workflow enacted in a social and digital environment. So it's social because they have network value. You use Mendeley, it has network value because you get recommendations, you can see what other people have, you can save other people's um, work. Uh, people make connections, they find new things. Um, these programs generate analytics that can be used for recommendations, uh, which they are. So what you have is this move in a period of very few short years from a situation where you had this uh, solitary manual activity to this sort of network digital social activity to the extent, and if you think about where things are going, if you think about ResearchGate or Google Scholar, which currently maybe don't provide quite that functionality but could easily or provide parts of it, you're, you have a move from this solitary uh, activity to a situation where really you're looking at a workflow manager, a discovery engine, a social network built around um, citations, built around uh, people's publications. And I'll come back to that because publications are social objects. They're things that people make connections around and they uh, share. But what you have is this shift from um, um, uh, an uh, unconnected activity to really an activity which for many people has become social, digital workflow uh, important. If you think about institutional repositories, uh, the uh, paper that Spark produced, I think this was in 1992, uh, a, a case for the institutional repository, sort of galvanized discussion around institutional repositories. We saw a lot of development over the next few years. A lot of that development focused on uh, software. So uh, we had DSpace, Fedora, ePrints uh, in the UK, 
Um, so these are the packages that, that supported uh, institutional repository. And for a while, much of the institutional repository seemed like a software discussion. Are you using DSpace or Fedora? How do we do things? So there was the, that institutional repository discussion was dominated a little bit by the repository software. Um, some discussion about how well these things aren't really working, are they? Do we not need to reach out? Do we not need to understand how faculty are behaving at work at Rochester, especially? I think quite interesting there, which led them to adapt DSpace in various ways or to uh, build some of their own functionality to do faculty profiles to try and, and sort of figure out what is it that uh, faculty really want from these things. Um, you know, it's not just a, a, a software repository off to the side. And then, 2008, famous uh, article by uh, Dorothea um, uh, Salo, where she uh, talks about some of the issues that have arisen with uh, repositories. And, um, I, you know, the takeaway for me from that article was what she was saying was, well, um, there's a lack, of a lack of attention to incentives and to workflows. If something is going to be successful, it has to be aligned with the incentives of the people you want to use it, and it has to be easy for them to use in the context of being aligned with their workflows. You don't want them to switch contexts to do their work here and then have to oh, lift themselves up and over here to do something else. Um, so uh, she concludes that they, they won't be successful unless they're part of a bigger framework, a wider range of things. But I think those two things, incentives um, and uh, workflows, are really quite important. Now, in the interim, what we've seen is the emergence, obviously, of a whole set of activities in this space and around this space, and um, clearly, and, and many of them are being discussed here. We've got a lot of work on uh, research data. Um, the progress of Figshare has been quite interested. Those of you who haven't looked at the collection of companies in digital science should, you know, digital science, this um, company set up by Macmillan to incubate uh, scientific productivity and workflow uh, or uh, companies, you know, Symplectic, Figshare, Altmetric, Readcube, and others, all digital science companies, really very interesting um, initiative. Um, Dataverse, I think, is going to be talked about here. So you've got a, a whole set of activities around uh, research data, some uh, third party provided, some uh, community oriented, and some people looking at institution repositories for that. You've got the uh, big growth in uh, expertise, profile, um, uh, social networking, um, uh, research gate, I think. Uh, I'll come back to that as well, quite interesting. You've got uh, systems like Pure and Symplectic, which are widely used outside the US, not quite so heavily used in the US yet, but I think will be more to manage research information, the information about the research activity, including publications and outputs, and then generating uh, profiles, uh, um, you know, expertise, portals. Um, Pure is now owned by um, Elsevier. Um, Thomson Reuters has a similar product called Converis. Um, Symplectic is a digital science company and uh, uh, various U.S. organizations beginning to buy them. But, but there's a big overlap between those and what historically might have been the institutional repository. So what you have is um, um, a situation where need identified, software solution. We don't need a software solution. We need a social software solution. And now a whole set of activities uh, which sort of relate to this space um, now, eprints.org, uh, does anybody here use eprints? Uh, was that two? Three? How many times have you been to the Lita Forum? <laughs> um, the, um, so two or three people use ePrints. ePrints, again, widely used in the UK, used in various other places. Developed at the University of Southampton. Part of a really very interesting academic setup, which, is the, uh, which was for many years the disciplinary home of Stephen Harnad, uh, the open access evangelist. Also, they have a visiting appointment there from Tim Berners-Lee uh, because they have a, um, a, a specialism in web, what they call web science. Part of that is a big emphasis on uh, open access, and they developed the ePrints uh, software to support that. It's widely used in the UK and elsewhere. I think if you look at numbers and so on, it's, it's not, quite le not quite widely as used as DSpace, but, but not really miles and miles behind. It's, it's heavily used. Uh, Les Carr is a professor, a faculty member, works on web science, works on various things. He's the lead for um, ePrints. And I, um, there's a uh, conference every year, and he did this uh, presentation at this conference last year where he talks about repositories. 
And I've put a box around uh, the web, both shapes and is shaped by society. So this is coming out very much from their web science type thinking. They're, they're promoting a view of the web that is very much a socio-technical um, uh, instrument. It's something that's social and technical. It, um, um, so the web shapes society and the web is shaped by society. You do online shopping, online shopping drives an interest in recommendation, drives an interest in things like Square. Um, so it's continually evolving and changing the way you behave. At the same time, that's changing the way physical shopping works. You go into Nordstrom and you'll see a, uh, a rack of things that are popular on Pinterest. You go into Best Buy and you'll see the floor arranged in a completely different way than you would have a, a few years ago. You'll see them price matching. So, so the web influences what we do. What we do influences the web. It's this, and he, he uses this uh, Escher type figure to express that. Um, so what he says is there's a gap between the script proposed by a technology and what it actually becomes in practice. So the script for institutional repositories, we'll, we'll put these wonderful pieces of software out there and they'll fill up with all this stuff and we'll share it with the world. That's not quite what happened. And what he's saying is we have to understand the social context into which that fits. But it's not just the social context. The social context is facilitated by the technical means and the technical means shape what social context do you want to um, 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 deploy? <clears throat> so he talks about repositories in this context, that really um, repositories, to be successful, um, have to engage with workflow, have to engage with um, uh, what people do. I, I put in the, on the right-hand side, he's saying that the engagement of the library community and the repository movement has led to a variety of other interests, you know, are there parallel interests, and those in turn are influencing how um, uh, repositories develop. Um, so um, the uh, technical environment allows things to happen. Things that, allow, that are allowed to happen change what we want from the technical environment. It's this socio-technical sort of circle. And you know, he talks about where um, e-prints uh, are going to go. And uh, um, slightly small, but very ambitious down there, open access, uh, open scientific data, open educational resources, research management reporting, and institutional marketing. That's what I spoke about earlier, the reputation management, the type of thing that Pure or Symplectic is, is doing, or Vivo to some extent. Uh, information management, project and funding data, the sort of research information. Um, uh, um, and he talks about they want to position this uh, as a set of uh, functionalities that support the data-driven university. That increasingly the university wants to uh, manage a variety of uh, types of data which drive the um, um, uh, activities of the university. So there you had three examples, um, cell phones, uh, collection manager, um, collection manager, citation managers, uh, institutional repositories where it's sort of, uh, you know, and, and some, sometimes we talk about those as technology, as identifiable technologies. But in fact, when you look at them, they're, they're involved in this really quite um, uh, uh, deeply embedded, interconnected, subtle interchange with the ways in which we behave and the ways in which we behave change what we expect from them. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, the, the fate, if you like, of institutional repositories is quite a nice example of that. And the different trajectory of the uh, citation manager is uh, uh, another example. So, um, in, in, in trying to uh, think about, um, you know, the ways in which things have changed, I think we, you know, in our times, uh, those of us who are old, um, you, you have a, a situation where things were automated. Um, and then things were networked. We networked together the things that were automated. And we, we had a variety of things on the, on the, on the network. And I, you know, I really look for a better word than socio-technical. Um, you know, I couldn't, couldn't really find one. But what I want to convey by that third thing is to say we've now moved beyond that things are networked. We've moved into a situation where many of our activities are carried out in digital environments, and those digital environments are important to what we do, and what we do shapes those digital environments. If you think about cell phones, if you think about shopping, 
And you know, what I'm going to talk about is research and learning. If you think about what your constituencies, what your students are doing, what your faculties are doing, they are managing research and learning activities in this really very richly uh, supported uh, network environment that doesn't always work perfectly, but has changed enormously in the, in the last few years. And trying to convey that by this word socio-technical that is you know, used in various contexts that increasingly many of our social activities, our behaviors are supported by a technical framework and the two are, they reshape each other. So it's not just that we are on the network or that we connect to the network, it's that our behaviors, our practices are enacted in digital environments and they're connected in, in important ways. And, you know, it's not a good word and, and you know, the, 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 maybe it's not a real thing if we don't have a buzzword for it. Um, Socio-technical is sort of an academic buzzword for it. And you have, you know, you could talk about pervasive. Um, you have a variety of other things. The, in, in a more business context, you're seeing a lot of discussion about, or some discussion about the industrial internet. Um, or which in some contexts, the in, in, in internet of things. But the industrial internet, meaning that um, the, the web, technology, digitization is moving into the fabric of how uh, businesses are run, how, how, how things are uh, uh, managed and done. It's not merely you know, connecting systems together, it's the, the use of data, the use of analytics, the, the things are run in that software environment. From a more, um, oh yeah, and then as I say, yeah, the technical reshapes the social, the social reshapes the technical. From a, um, um, you know, more uh, techy uh, point of view. Some of you may have seen Mark Andreessen, the, you know, the uh, Netscape um, uh, um, uh, founder, now venture capitalist in, in um, um, uh, Silicon Valley, came up with this famous phrase, software eats the world. Um, you know, so what he's saying, increasingly uh, businesses, activities have a software element, a mediated element, a network element, a digital element, and he, he, software eats the world was his phrase. So technology is a central part of how we enact work, communication, organization. Um, our view of technology, I think, that we have sometimes belongs to an earlier era. We think of discrete systems and the impacts of those systems separated from the, from the sort of impacts, the network, um, 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 uh, way in which we actually do work. I mean, I occasionally get, I'm, you know, I'm very struck by, by this, uh, you know, if you think about from a, I was going to say from a library director's point of view, but, but I better not, but if you say, um, I occasionally get rung by recruiters. Not because they're interested in my unique gifts, but they think that, um, you know, might be able to, to talk to them about other people or, or have, a, have a view of, of the world. And quite often now, they, they sort of talk about people who are digital or technology literate or something. And it's a very odd type of discussion because, you know, you have this image or, or sense that you've got real life and then you've got technology. And what we want is somebody who understands this stuff and can apply it to this stuff. And, but that's not the way things work. Um, you know, this stuff is all technology mediated. Technology is a part of this stuff. You know, they're not separate entities. If you see them as separate entities, you end up, you know, falling into either a sort of, uh, oh, you know, really hype technology, um, um, you know, the sort of futurist, whatever type thing. If you, if you, um, you know, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, you get into this trap of, oh, you know, I'm interested in the softer side. I'm, I don't do technology. You know, we have to, we have to remember the human ends and so on. That's a completely false distinction um, because, you know, the human ends are uh, what we do, our behaviors are, are carried out in, in network environments. So when we think about them separately that way, we end up being sort of either technologically a bit determinist or um, behaving as if it doesn't exist. And, you, can, you know, you can see that those behaviors, you know, very clearly in our, in our community. So I think we have to begin to think that really we're supporting behaviors and practices that are enacted in technology environments. There's not technology over here and behaviors over here. Our behaviors, our practices are enacted in technology environments. And uh, our focus, that, that changes our focus, I think, in quite uh, serious uh, as well as um, subtle ways. So, 
To come back then to the, the areas I said I'd have a, have, a, have a closer look at, and as I say, these are all areas that you're all uh, very familiar with and are coping with um, uh, all the time, I think. What I think, though, is that we're in this sort of transition um, between the organizations and structures that were still quite important and, and sort of print-shaped. We've sort of moved away from them, but, you know, we've, we've got... Um, you know, at dinner last night, there was a discussion about emerging technology librarians, or uh, I think uh, one of our colleagues was an emerging services librarian. And I was suggesting the next time they have an annual appraisal or, or a review, they should say, um, well, have I emerged yet? You know, <laughs> or, um, you know, is, is, you know, are we emerged? Has it emerged? You know, because, um, you know, emerging technology, all right, new, I mean, who says new, te new technologies drives me crazy? What is a new technology? You know, uh, yeah. oh look, a new technology. But the, the um, uh, emerging, it sort of suggests that there's an area over here that, that, that is sort of um, different from behavior and then we can attach to behavior or something. Now, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating because clearly from a management point of view, you want to focus attention on certain things. So that type of thing does focus attention. But I think the way in which we talk about it is um, you know, indicative of this sort of feeling that, that you paint on technology or that technology is something you pick up and move over. Um, so the, type, the things that I'm talking about are, are sort of transitions that we're engaged in. And I think because they're transitions, we, we sort of have some structures that belong to a different way of doing things. And we're trying to figure out how to do that transition, how to move things. And, and that's led to a variety of sort of temporary uh, constructs like emerging technology uh, librarian, um, you know, which uh, very soon will emerge from their chrysalis beautifully. Um, <laughs> Beautiful, but in fact, if we're lucky, if we're lucky, that event might happen while we're in the room. We'll see a butterfly, <laughs> we'll see a butterfly fluttering, fluttering up. Um, but these are all areas where we're moving from one set of activities to sort of thinking about doing things in a different way, and the different way will become dominant or very important, or will need to be organizationally managed in a way, not not just something that's on the margin or the side, or the you know the special unit over here, or, you know, oh, we have to manage research, uh, we have to manage research uh, data, okay, here's our research data coordinator. You know, we have to, you know, that type of. Uh. So, uh, consumption to um, creation. This is a picture I quite like that was developed by my colleague, uh, Brian Lavoy. We have a report called the Evolving Scholarly Record, which goes into this in more detail. The main point here is that, um, you know, once, uh, what we did was we managed outcomes. We managed books and journals, the final product, the exhibition that was put on after the research was over, the book or the journal. We managed those, we brought them into the library, people used them, went away and did their work, and produced more of those exhibitions, more of those final outputs, more of those books and journals which, which we managed. So the interaction was with the final output because in the digital world, or in the print world, that was really um, um, the, the most efficient and sensible way of doing things. Now that we're in a, a digital environment and have been for some time, and the way in which um, research has sort of been reconfigured or reshaped by this digital environment, and the way in which teaching is being done is being reshaped, what we're seeing is that the process and the aftermath of the output are generating, or of the research process or learning process are generating materials. So now, we're not just interested in the outcomes, we may be interested in the method. So scientists are publishing their methods, and there are some services that will allow you to publish your methods. We're very interested in evidence, so this is research data. You know, we want, we want um, to capture and manage the data because uh, we want uh, the science to be replicated, we want uh, other people to do things, so huge interest in managing research data. Uh, and then discussion, um, you know, there may be pre-prints, there may be technical, uh, technical reports, you know, some disciplines will publish things uh, in an early form, there may be blogging that some researchers do, there may be conferences, pre-outcomes, um, uh, the publication, but then afterwards, there's obviously more discussion and commentary, there may be revision, there may be, um, you know, chunking, you know, putting into, um, uh, other things, and a variety, a variety of ways of reusing. So if you think about the environment that we're managing, it's no longer just managing necessarily the outputs, the final outputs, which is what we're used to. We're sort of thinking about that full range. 
And especially we're thinking about the process. If you think about going back to the institutional repository, you know, that was thinking about how do you, how do you manage uh, e-prints or whatever, research data discussion, how do we manage that? Um, if you think about you know, some of the discussions around expertise, the Vivo type discussion, that's, you know, so thinking how do you manage some of the context of the research or the learning in a way that it can be described and disclosed uh, efficiently so that it can be discovered. And again, you can, you, know, you can surround that with a variety of um, you know, services that have emerged. I've put some uh, up here. If you think about what their, what their uh, focus is, you know, individual libraries are doing things. There are third-party services. There are collaborations. There are commercial services. But we've seen, again, in the last you know, five, 10 years, an explosion of um, uh, interest and activity in, in all of these um, areas. Um, so the publication activity, the scholarly record, which if you like is a central element of what we do or what we have done, has exploded a little bit. It's, it's now not just the final product, the final exhibition, it's these other things as well. And, and many of our discussions are in fact about managing some of those, uh, some of those other things. I, I, um, so this means that you know, libraries obviously are beginning to think about, well, what types of services do we provide to help people uh, manage uh, some of those things or to, to do them on campus? This is a list I quite like. Um, this is uh, by Kurt de Belder, who manages um, Leiden, University of Leiden uh, Library in the Netherlands. And uh, he, uh, he's been spending time saying he wants to position the library as what he calls a partner in knowledge. Um, you know, which sounds you know, fine and quite grand. But when it drills down, he's very specific. By partner in knowledge, he means all the things that uh, researchers and learners need to do on campus to get their work done, how do we figure out how to partner with them uh, around creating information, managing information, preserving information, using information? Uh, we're not just interested in the final exhibit. We want to partner across the full life cycle. And so the list here, again, is a list that you'll see um, you know, from many libraries, and there are things that you're grappling with. I just thought it was nice to see this laid out. So uh, virtual research environments are basically sort of um, workflow, community type uh, environments. I mean, they're local, whether that's um, you know, a long-term thing, I don't know. Uh, data management and curation, text and data mining, copyright, GIS, publication support. Uh, further areas to be identified. So what they're beginning to do is to say, we have to organize our library and our work around these types of things, not around managing um, publications for um, uh, students, for uh, learning, for teaching, thesis repository, digital information skills and in the curriculum, support for open courseware, support for MOOCs, and library learning centers. So a set of things that we're all quite familiar with and come up. I, as I say, I just thought it was interesting that he sort of said, he laid them out like this and said, you know, our focus has to shift to beginning to think about how we partner with people on campus to actually create value across that whole life cycle um, because uh, things are changing. So this, you know, they, uh, previously we'd managed the final product, we'd managed the print uh, journal or book. Now what's happening as the digital environment means that information is used, generated, consumed across this whole life cycle, there are a variety of places where potentially um, support or, or intervention is, is useful. And these are just some uh, examples, and as I say, the, uh, you know, there are examples, in, I'm sure, in all of your environments. I quite like um, um, the Access Ceramics is um, um, uh, faculty at Lewis and Clark College, faculty working uh, with uh, the library to develop this database of ceramics. They put some of the images on Flickr. They, so it's a community resource, but local scholarly resource, and it's a partnership between a department who has a particular interest and goal and the library who sees itself these types of partnerships as central to its future. How do we help the faculty fulfill or meet their information goals, their creation goals? You know, this is, this is how we do it. The Provincetown Public uh, Press, I quite like, this is a public library, which has got into uh, sort of more organized support for self-publishing for uh, authors in the community. So it works with authors in the community who want to self-publish and provides um, services for those. Uh, University of Technology at Sydney Library has quite a nice uh, set of activities, including uh, ePress, 
and then you know the type of services that are springing up in a, a variety of contexts you know under digital support uh, digital scholarship digital humanities but sort of uh, this is uh, just an example of data visualization services section at um, Duke University so we're seeing uh, and you know in, in all your campuses we're seeing and, and environments we're seeing this type of um, um, you know activity emerge the reason I'm flagging it as sort of pre-strategic in some ways is um, we don't yet have a sense of you know, how all of this rolls up into the overall activity of the library as a, as a major emphasis. Is this going to end up being 30% of what the library does? Is it going to, you know, at the moment we have a variety of ways of trying to tackle this in special units or, or other types of things, but it's clearly um, uh, very important. Okay, workflow is the new content. Now, I will be the first to admit that this may not be a phrase that catches on. Um, however, I, I, um, I'm going to try it for a while. Um, so what we have in the library environment, uh, sorry, in the research environment and in the learning environment, as I, going back to what I said about socio-technical, increasingly people are having their workflow supported by tools and services. Um, you know, they use Mendeley, they use ResearchGate, they use uh, you know, a variety of uh, things. Not everybody, and lots of people don't use anything. Um, one of the uh, interesting things over the last few years, I think, has been the uh, ethnographic uh, work. I mean, my own view is that uh, this has sort of subtly changed the way in which we think about things. That, you know, being pioneered in the middle there in Rochester, you know, the uh, taking an ethnographic uh, uh, view, actually going out and talking to people, talking to their families, um, talking to... Uh, um, uh, and, you know, the, the, you know, there were sort of various headlines from this work, you know, attention grabbing, oh, well, you know, if students work at 3.30 in the morning, you should be open at 3.30 in the morning, or um, you should do outreach to parents because parents are still heavily involved in, in their children's work and, and so on. Um, one story I heard, I don't, I don't think it was from Rochester, maybe it was from Rochester or somewhere else, that there was an anxious phone call. Somebody wanted to retrieve a student uh, dissertation or something from a repository because... Um, her mother had all these annotations in it, and they hadn't, she hadn't saved changes. She hadn't said, you know, so um, the, 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 the file as um, submitted uh, still had her, her, um, her mother's, you know, uh, remarks with the track changes on, and she hadn't sort of accepted the changes and um, whatever. So they, but, you know, that type of uh, work, I don't think that was, maybe it wasn't Rochester, maybe it was, but, you know, you've got the aerial work, uh, which is influenced by Rochester. Uh, we do uh, a project called Visitors and Residents, which takes a very similar view. But I think this sort of uh, ethnographic work that actually goes out um, and uh, looks at what people are um, actually uh, doing, um, you know, so from a, um, you know, the, uh, discovering that people value convenience, convenience trumps quality, um, the cost of context switching. If I do things in a particular way and with a particular set of tools, I don't really want to have to switch over here. Cost of fragmentation, if it's difficult to navigate, you know, view stuff. Uh, the importance of relationships, working together. You know, that really our, our view of how our uh, uh, people who use our services, what they do, sort of changing um, different needs. Um, so really, uh, the importance of this work, and I, and I, think, I think it's... It has changed things maybe in a way that we don't always recognize is that we were much more alert and you know that lots of projects were influenced by this and you know several libraries now have resident uh, anthropologists or uh, user-centered design sort of coming from a similar um, side but the I think what, what it emphasized was that um, what people are actually doing is very important and we need to understand that because behaviors are changing and what they say they do is not what they're actually doing. You know, that there's a big difference. You know, doing surveys, doing focus groups and so on doesn't quite get you there because, you know, people will, people will not always, not that they'll uh, mislead you, but they'll, you know, not always say what they're actually doing. Visitors and residents is something that we're doing, um, uh, Lynn Conway. Um, and uh, David White in the UK, um, uh, and uh, with UNC Charlotte. So um, the, the model that they've produced is they've said, when you think about the socio-technical environment, people tend to, you know, I think we're all a bit, you know, the digital native thing, we all know that students don't use things better than other people or, you know. The, so they said, you know, maybe a different way of looking at this is visitors and residents. 
Some people treat the network in a very functional way, instrumental way. Um, you know, they, they just want to get things done. Uh, they do their banking, they do their assignment, they do whatever. A lot of people, in a growing number, are sort of more residential. They see it as a part of their uh, identity. Uh, they're visible, they communicate, it's part of uh, their social interaction, it's really part of their, their, their identity forming. And what they've been doing over the last while is sort of charting um, people's behaviors on an axis of visitor resident and also personal institutional. And you know, doing a sort of longitudinal survey of people as they move through sort of high school into, into university, into those people that go on to postgraduate to see how things change and you know, what they're discovering is really um, you know, confirms a lot of uh, what we, what we um, thought. This is somebody who is sort of quite residential from a personal point of view, but quite instrumental from a work point of view, or from an um, you know, um, um, uh, institutional point of view. So, um, the, uh, but some of the comments really are, you know, they've been interviewing, they've been doing focus groups, they've been observing, following. Um, it tends to be, uh, I can't be bothered to read a huge book. Um, if I can't be bothered to read something on a huge book, I will surf on the internet for it because it will come up in shorter pieces. Um, now, who couldn't be against that? Huh? <laughs> um, uh, or I will just go and see a professor. Um, actually, that's interesting, the internet. There was a discussion at dinner last night about whether people say the web or what they say. So there is somebody who says the internet. Um, when I'm writing a bibliography and I put too many websites in, it makes me feel really bad. Um, so what, to, what, what does somebody like that do? They go to Wikipedia and they put the references in that are at the bottom of the Wikipedia article. Um, that's what they found. Um, you know, that's a major use of Wikipedia. It's to find references that are at the bottom of the Wikipedia articles. Um, Sometimes I do maybe Google Wikipedia, sometimes I do maybe Google or Wikipedia some subjects. Uh, so using Wikipedia as a verb. Uh, for example, I have an Italian presentation on Tuesday and I needed to research that quite a bit on Google and Wikipedia um, to make sure I didn't say anything stupid. Um, uh, maybe not 24 seven, but at least half the day I will spend either talking on the phone or using it for some texts. Down here, I thought this was interesting at the bottom. My friend in computer science, he had a written exam, and he said, my gosh, uh, well, I'm sure he didn't say that. Um, I, I had such a bad hand cramp. And I said, that's because you always type. I haven't written a proper sentence in two years by hand. Um, so we've, we've been collecting this data. We have really a lot of data about you know, what students are doing and what they're doing as they move, uh, as they move up. And one of the you know, major things to come out is that, that people are engaging with systems and materials in the network, you know, which is where they do their work, and this user-owned literacies. They're putting together their work environments. They're putting together the sets of tools that they, that they like using. Um, and, and as they progress, those tools are changing, but they have sets of, um, of tools that they like. Now, to go back to the Wikipedia thing, one of the nice phrases to come out of this work, or one of the concepts that sort of resonated quite a bit, is the, is the uh, learning black marker. So, uh, when my son uh, has a homework assignment, the first thing he does is he types the question into Yahoo Answers to see if somebody, you know, if it's a math problem, he types it into Yahoo Answers to see if somebody has already tackled this. Um, what they're saying is that when they have looked at student behaviors, what people are doing, um, um, uh, talking on Facebook about what, um, you know, what, what to do, or texting, looking at Wikipedia, Yahoo Answers, that these really are very prominent sources and, and ways in which people do things. But it's a black market because they can't be reported. So you spend all your time on Wikipedia doing the assignment, then you have to find a few references which you retrofit to the assignment. And one way of retrofitting the uh, 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 um, references is by going to the, to the uh, Wikipedia. So they're finding a lot of that type of activity. So just thinking about the way in which people do things. If you think about this uh, scholarly environment, we're seeing emerging residential behavior, as you like, if you like. If you look at the range of tools that uh, people use, 
Um, you know, we have a, a range of important discovery hubs around disciplines on the network, you know, Archive, SSRN, Repec. Um, we have uh, discovery and fulfillment hubs, Scholar, Books, uh, Amazon, um, Social Discovery, Scholarly Reputation Management, uh, Mendeley, ResearchGate, uh, Social Description, Reading Sites, Goodreads, Library Thing, um, Wikipedia, Yahoo Answers, Khan Academy, you know, Assignments, Galaxy Sue, Figshare, Open Refine, Thinking About Data Storage, Data Manipulation, I think I saw Open Refine on the um, agenda, you know, GitHub clearly, central role now in terms of software management. So, uh, in addition to institutional resources that the library or the institution may be providing, um, um, we're seeing a lot of this self-created, uh, uh, you know, the, our, uh, what the, uh, in the student context, self-owned literacy, self-owned workflows, uh, you know, self-constructed workflows in these environments. This is a slide from uh, Wouter Hack from Hel Elsevier, um, where they, you know, just going through the stages of um, uh, research workflow, noting um, all the um, services that were potentially Available, so I, I don't put it up, you know, to, to look at all the individual pieces, but just again to give a sense of the richness of the environment. So, from a workflow point of view, we're seeing in, in learning behaviors and research behaviors that social activity is reshaping the technical, the sets of tools that are available, and those tools are reshaping the social activity that um, happens around them. So in a print world, researchers and learners would build their workflow around the library because they had to come to the library and the, the uh, library had a limited interaction with the full process. It, it, it dealt with the, in a digital world, increasingly the library needs to think about how to organize itself around the workflows of researchers and uh, learners because you know, they're, they're building these things. And, and we, we, we've seen a, a variety of ways in which people are doing that. But workflows are beginning to generate and consume information resources. Um, so it's sort of flip, you know, the library needs to think about how are researchers and learners behaving and how do I connect to that, how do I support to that, rather than expecting people to come to the library. And how do you, how do you arrange yourself to think about that? Okay, so related to that, quite quickly, um, this is a grid that we've used uh, quite a bit. I've changed it a little bit, but Basically, thinking about two axes, you've got low stewardship, high stewardship, um, you know, money, attention, resources is spent on stuff or it isn't. And then in many collections are institutional and few collections. So stuff is, you know, mass published, mass produced, spread around the place, or it's unique and institutional. What you get if you fill in that grid is the licensed published stuff, the stuff that um, libraries have spent most of their time and attention on, and, and probably still do, is in that upper right corner, uh, you know, mass published in many collections um, and tend to be highly stewarded. There's a whole industry devoted to this. There's subscription agents, there, there's workflows, supply chains, there are libraries, um, so quite a bit. Institutional and few collections and high stewardship, that tends to be archives, special collections, what we do um, um, in, in there. Less stewarded, but becoming more stewarded, and certainly important, are research and learning materials, open educational uh, materials, research data, e-prints, a variety of um, uh, those types of things, generated by the institution. And then in this quadrant, this is maybe not quite right, but, but it, you know, it sort of works. What you find on the open web, it's, it's available in lots of places. You can search for it, you can cache it, you can you know, download it, but it, you know, it tends to be you know, pieces of it are stewarded, but as a whole, it's not. So just thinking about this from a, a high level summary point of view, what you have is below the line here, you have research and learning materials, data curation, um, uh, the, the outputs of research and learning that are becoming of more interest to uh, institutions, and you have the special collections and, and so on that have always been. And those two are sort of you know, becoming similar to each other in some ways. You know, the, the issue is how do I make the rest of the world know about these? Um, how do I preserve them? Um, um, how do, um, you know, they're, they're an institutional responsibility, they're not a, um, so there's a sort of inside out thing about them, we want to share them with the world, whereas the published stuff tends to be outside in, I want to buy stuff or license stuff and make it available to my community, so quite a different um, dynamic. But we don't manage them quite like that. Um, so if you think about, yeah, um, published materials, special collections, research and learning materials, um, 
Stuff above the line tends to be widely available. The library, though, buys things, makes them uh, more easily available. Below the line is distinctive. Above the line, outside in. Below the line, inside out. Above the line, the library is a broker. Maximize efficiency, get things to you, save the time of the uh, researcher, save the time of the learner, um, 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 uh, act as a buyer. Below the line, increasingly, the library as a provider, maximize discoverability, sharing these things with the world. So very different dynamic. Um, but I don't think we've sort of quite teased those two apart because certainly not from a discovery point of view, we tend to put those things into maybe the discovery layer, but haven't spent as much time thinking about who do I want to share these with, where should they, where should they go. Clearly there are things like WorldCat, DPLA, a variety of things that do push those things out to the world, but as, a, as something to uh, think about hasn't got as much uh, attention. And that brings you on to question about um, discoverability. Um, clearly, uh, you know, libraries are investing in discovery layers. This is an important part of providing an entry to uh, materials that have been licensed uh, or purchased. A uh, very fine one here. Um, but then discovery is not just the discovery layer. And I think there was some discussion yesterday, you know, the phrase I use is discovery often happens uh, elsewhere, uh, as we know. Um, and there's a growing challenge about making institutional resources discoverable um, elsewhere. So if you, if you think about that, um, you know, just quickly mention three things. The first, full library discovery. You want to make more than your books and journals discoverable. People matter. The people in, in, in an institution are an important part of that discoverability requirement. And then not everything happens at your website. So increasingly you're managing a decentered network presence. Um, but again, this is sort of pre-strategic. It's not something that is very consciously managed in places, a lot of places. Um, okay. Full library discovery, very quickly, uh, we focused on discovery of collections. Increasingly, people are interested in services, they're interested in expertise, they're interested in events, they're interested in various other things. And libraries are beginning to think about how do I make it easier to discover. Cambridge University Library has identified service discovery as a big issue. They say, you know, they've had some of this ethnographic style work with their students, and they're saying their students just don't know what services are available. How do we allow them to discover services when they need them? Um, as I put there, if your expertise is not seen, you won't be seen as an expert. So some libraries beginning to offer um, um, li librarians, you know, uh, specialists uh, alongside other things, and I think Michigan sort of pioneered this by, by indexing their uh, librarians. The um, people, we're seeing a growing interest in realizing, and you know, this comes back to Vivo or various other things, realizing that um, Institutions are interested in reputation management, expertise and profiling, the identity of their uh, scholars. Um, they want to make those available and discoverable. Kenning Arlich, some of you may have seen talking about new knowledge work, and one of the areas he identifies as new knowledge work is working with faculty on the range of identifiers that they have available to them on thinking about profiling, on thinking about where they uh, should put publications, on thinking about SEO strategies for the web. And the power of pull then, as people are working in these workflows, how do you connect library capacities uh, where it makes sense? And what you have in this environment, going back to what I said, researchers as well now in this, you know, ResearchGate is really very interesting. People should have a look at that, and I'm sure many, many of you are on it, many of your faculty are on it. But this, you know, wanting to share, wanting to push material out, but connecting that with identity, reputation, visibility, um, really, really uh, quite interesting, and things are changing um, as we move along. So uh, if you look at the sort of Google Scholar profiles, uh, this is a ResearchGate profile for this person who writes about technology and organizations. Really quite rich environments now, gives some analytics, gives a, a, a profile. Um, 
article in Nature pointing out the reach of some of these. Google Scholar is used, they claim, by they talk to 3,000 science and engineer, scientists and engineers, and Google Scholar visited more often than Facebook, which seems a little bit surprising. But ResearchGate visited regularly by almost half the people they spoke to. Uh, Google Scholar by 60%. Social Science Humanities a little bit less, but again, interesting to look at that, um, interesting to look at that range. So from a workflow point of view, clearly we've become used to saying we need to configure the resolver so that our resources show up in various places. But looking from an inside out point of view, how do we engage with researcher profiling, reputation management, research information management in terms of thinking about this new requirement or newer requirement to really expose those types of things in a network environment? We're nearly there. Uh, the decentered network presence, these are some slides from some discussions I had with uh, a couple of universities a couple of years ago uh, to try and find out where they were putting some of their effort. And what emerged very clearly was when you think about the network presence of the library, there were these four areas, the website, and that tended to attract a lot of attention because there's still a view of that as the front door. But in fact, the institutions, they were doing quite a lot of external syndication. They were pushing data to places. They were pushing metadata to places. They were pushing services, you know. Um, you know th they were doing things like proxy toolbars, widgets, various things, and putting them in various places. Cloud sourced, clearly they were beginning to, you know, libguides would be a good example of being able to do something quickly and easily and circumventing a variety of uh, local procedural technology committee work that you can just get this done quickly in the cloud and do clearly some things you can't do that, but that was a big. And then decoupled communication, using various social networks to push communication out and move beyond the Facebook page, but to think about doing things in a different way. Um, so this is a list of um, um, where UCL in London has um, uh, you know, social networking presences. And a variety of libraries are doing a variety of things. And they're really trying to engage in conversation and do things. Um, Cambridge has a variety of blogs. A couple of them actually quite scholarly. So what they're trying to do is to create conversation and interest and create people you know, finding things coming in. These are the places that uh, Cambridge University Library syndicates to. Now, it's a couple of years ago, so RSS was quite important, maybe a bit less now. But they put, uh, you know, you've got metadata in WorldCat, you've got metadata in a variety of places, you've got services in a variety of places, you've got data in a variety of places. And sort of thinking about how do you manage this in a purposeful um, way has emerged. Thinking about SEO, I know that's a discussion point here. Thinking about how that relates to schema.org, that's become a sort of big issue. So we have a whole set of activities around thinking, how do I push things out into the network environment that are different in character and so on than how do I attract people to my website? So again, thinking about this technical environment that people are working in, can I make people find my things? And this is just, you know, our library resources visible where people are doing their work. Is library expertise visible where people are searching for things? Are there blogs about special collections or distinctive services or expertise? As attention shifts from collections to services, are library services described in such a way that they're discoverable? Metadata for resources shared with all relevant places. Okay. So to uh, finish, you know, what I've talked about are the ways in which you know, technology is changing things, and that I think we've moved past a situation where we think of technology over here and real life here. They you know, work together. So what we need to think about is less emerging, you know, it's here, not think about technology versus social or versus people, you know, we not allow that type of discussion. But really, uh, our activities, the activities of our researchers and learners have moved to these technology-mediated environments. And we really need to figure out how to support those and how to connect to those by being much more technologically literate and savvy ourselves about the ways in which these things work and the ways in which they, they do things. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>